Sometimes it's very hard to construct one of these things. So, so what this talk is about is a, a situation in which you have such a problem, uh, and um, it's about semi-strict higher categories. So, uh, and it's about a solution uh, to a known problem in that area using the relatively recent notion of a skewment uh, category. So I say relatively recent, it's 2012, so for me that seems relatively recent for some of you, depending on your age, uh, it might seem not so recent. It's more common than me. So, uh, so, so where does this story start? So, so I have to tell you the, the whole story, I guess. So it begins with the category of sets, uh, which is the mother of all categories in some sense, so it's Cartesian closed, and so if you have a Cartesian closed category, the thing you can do is you can uh, look at categories enriched in it, so you can form the category of the enriched categories, and so this is again a Cartesian closed category, so, so this, this means that you can iterate this process, and you can start with sets, and then you can go to cat, so that's categories enriched in sets, and then to 2 cat, and then to n cat, for all finite n, so strict n categories. So, uh, so this is great. Uh, it's all pretty easy. Um, so before I say what the problem is, I mean this really is very nice. So these n categories form delightful categories. They're rotation close, but they're also uh, essentially algebraic, so they're locally finally presentable and all this sort of stuff that you might want. Uh, the, the problem is that for some purposes they're not sufficiently general, so, so for weak n categories. So, so the problem arises at dimension 3, so not every weak n category is equivalent to, uh, to a strict one. So, so what this, this tells us is that to capture uh, weak or structures using an iterative enrichment approach, we have to leave the world of Cartesian closed categories. Um, well, I still want to stick with developing structures in a ca purely categorical context, so uh, some other sort of more general uh, categorical structure. But so the first thing we can do is we can go from Cartesian closed categories to symmetric monoidal closed categories. So that's Kelly's context and that's great. So there's a so the problem here really arose at two cat. We considered the Cartesian product and we saw the categories enriched in there uh, weren't quite good enough. But what we can also do is consider the so-called gray tensor product due to gray. And so this again has unit the uh, terminal Object so it's semi-Cartesian, but tensor products can be described very nicely. But perhaps the more important thing about it is what the corresponding internal hum captures. So it captures the most important kind of uh, transformation in two category theory, namely the pseudo-natural transformations between two functors. So, so this is where you break uh, naturality doesn't hold strictly anymore but only up to an invertible two cell. And these then satisfy a coherent couple of coherence equations. But so these very naturally arise 
I have practice. So that tells us that this is a good cancer product to consider. And uh, so, so what are its nice properties? So, so first of all, we just mentioned the capture of pseudonatural transformations. So that's probably, for me, property number one, the most important. It's also homotopically, it gives what's called the minoidal model structure. Um, with respect to the natural model structure on two cats that you can consider the canonical one, really, due to Steve Black. Uh, so that's homotopically that shows that this is something very nice. Um, so the third thing is that the enriched categories in the great tensor product are called great categories, and these really do capture all weak three categories up to equivalents. On the other hand, they're also very strict, so people sometimes call them semi-strict three categories. They're in between strict ones and weak ones, sort of towards the stricter side, and so you can work with them quite well. But so, so what do they actually involve? So I won't say exactly, but they're almost as strict as three categories, but uh, our old friend, the middle four interchange fails. So, uh, what you know from uh, McLean's book is that if you have a diagram of natural transformations like this, uh, by naturality there's only one way to compose them. You can go this way, or this way, or this way, or this way. And in a two category, because cats in two category, they will agree by naturality, but in a gray category they don't agree, but you have an invertible three cell between them. And that satisfies the coherence conditions analogous to pseudo-naturality uh, equations, if you know those. But we don't really need to know that. So, uh, so, that's, so that's great categories, and that's the two-dimensional story. So, so what have we done now? We've escaped the world of Cartesian closed categories. Um, we sort of fixed the problem at the three-dimensional, two three-dimensional level by using symmetric monoidal closed categories. And so what we'd like to do is to continue now. Uh, the big question is can we find a symmetric monoidal closed structure on the category of great categories and strict maps, which has some of these uh, good properties that we've seen in the two-dimensional setting. Okay? And so, uh, so the answer is no. <laughs> so thank you. Um, but the story continues. Um, but it's very important to think about what the actual obstruction is. So why does it break down? So suppose this is due to Sir Krantz, um, who observed that suppose you had a symmetric monoidal closed structure on grey cats. Uh, and suppose it did model weak higher dimensional transformations, so they should involve some non commuting square and something in it, okay? That's all we need to know about them for to understand this argument. So, so then, so we've got this bomb, and its morphisms are going to be these higher pseudo transformations. So you can pick out a morphism of a category or a grey category by looking at maps out of the, just the free or just the gray category that's a single arrow, okay? It's like a category. Uh, so that picks out arena, but by, we have a symmetric monoidal closed category by assumption, so you can flip that round to a functor like this, and now this is a gray functor, so it's, you can equally view it as a map from A to POM to B. Uh, but this is a really this is really a great functor. So that means that it's functorial with one cells, and what it's going to force us to do. So what it's going to do is it's going to send an arrow across basically to this square, and then functorial functoriality in the one cells of A is going to force us to encode this equation, right? So we have to have this equality of two cells. But that's very strict at the three-dimensional level, where you would expect something a bit weaker. Okay? 
Not only is it unnaturally strict, it's in fact impossible because this AV is supposed to be a great category, so we're supposed to be able to compose these things, but transformations satisfying this equality can't actually be composed because you would have us, yeah, because the middle four interchange fails, so it's a good exercise. Uh, but for our point of view, it's enough to observe that it's sort of unnaturally strict. Uh, so this tells us that we have to leave the world of symmetric modal closed categories now. Uh, so where do we go? Well, first of all, before we figure out where to go, let's think about what we need to fix this situation. So, so the problem was that real transformations should involve some sort of invertible free cell, like that, okay? Uh, but the thing is that should correspond to some sort of pseudomap. And this is the crux of the issue, is that the transformations we want to model should correspond to a kind of pseudomap here, uh, because we don't want it to preserve uh, composition strictly. So, so the key point is that we need a way to encode pseudomaps. Um, now, how are we going to do that? Well, oh, well, so the first thing you might think is we can work with a category of pseudomaps. We can move away from a gray cat to a category of weaker maps. Um, the problem is that categories of weak maps are in general badly behaved. We don't leave our nice categorical setup. They won't be locally presentable. They lack limits and co-limits in general. Um, so we don't really want to do that. Uh, so what we would rather do is have stick with our category of gray categories and strict maps, but secretly somehow encode these weak maps in a clever way. And, and so the, the main thing is that, how do you, well, how do you do that? The answer is such a, a, so, something that enables you to do that is the notion of a skewmanoidal category, which secretly encodes weak maps. So, so let me remind you what a skewmanoidal category is. Uh, these are the very recent things from 2012. So, so they involve, they're just like manoidal categories, but you have these uh, coherence maps point in fairly random looking directions when you first see them. <coughs> and uh, they satisfy five equations. Uh, there's various other directions you could consider there, of course. And uh, so it looks a bit mad when you first see it. But, uh, so the monoidal ones are just, the usual ones are just the case where these maps are invertible. But so how does this humanoidal category enable you to construct capture weak maps. Well, the point is where you start to see the niceness of this definition of the of category is that you observe that tensoring the unit on the left uh, gives you a co-monad. Okay? Uh, part of the unexpected duality, I would say, of skewmanoidal categories is that on the other side, you also have a monad and a distributed law. Uh, this is not an obvious self-dual sort of definition, but in fact, if C is a skewmanoidal category, so is C up, um, which is something that's much better, say, than lax monoidal categories or structures like that. Uh, and it hints at a sort of kind of deep theory. <clears throat> um, but okay, so we've got this stuff, and that means we can just define a weak map to be a map in the Kleisley category for the Pomona. And that's how we can encode, uh, how we can encode weak maps. So that's how skewmanoidal categories can encode weak maps. Um, so another thing we're mentioning, so I'll just, this is just a definition. Closeness uh, is a one-sided closeness uh, for me. Following the street, that's all we'll have in our context. Uh, but Okay, so we call a uh, skewmanoidal category closed if it has this adjoint. If you have a home, and then so the next thing is that 
In this context, you can think of weak maps as elements of the home because to give a map from I A to B is to give a map from I to home and the jointness. And that says that elements of the home of a screamingoid enclosed category can be more general just than just the morphisms of your category. So they enable you to encode more flexible stuff. That's, the, uh, that's one of the ways of thinking of what a skewman oil category really is. It's a sort of fattened up structure that enables you to encode some extra stuff like we need to do in our setup. Oops. So, so okay, let me get on to now. What if in our situation, the correct, uh, in our opinion, mapping space for grey categories was where uh, a variant of it was introduced by Gala in 2012. And first of all, what are the pseudomaps? Well, these are extremely strict. They're basically just like normal pseudofunctors in two category theory. That really means that they preserve identity strictly. And you have an isomorphisms in two cell between this composite. So it's really could be could be an equivalence or something, but it's really a invertible two cell. Okay? But it's very strict. And they satisfy all the equations like in a, for a normal pseudofunctor in a two category theory. So uh, it's a very simple notion. Uh, and then secondly, he introduced these lax, well, people have looked at higher transformations uh, before, but so he considered these lax transformations which involve this. So you've just got a non vertical two cell and square, but invertible three cells here. Like I was telling you about. And his, his ones are really normal as well. So if you have an identity f, then this eta f is an identity. But so I'm, we're interested in, you know, semi strict higher categories and homotopically well behaved structures. And in that context, normality is rather natural. Normality is not going to break any monoidal model structure type of situation or anything like that. Um, so he introduced a mapping space gray category like this. Uh, what I want to tell, tell you about for the remainder of the talk oops, is a variation of it. So a mapping space uh, gray category involving pseudo transformations. Okay, so these are the ones where E to F is a adjoint equivalence plus a little bit more stuff. So this is the natural notion of pseudo transformation. Um, and so our first theorem with uh, of Gabriella and me is that there's a closed skewmanoidal structure on Grey Cat whose internal home captures these pseudo maps and pseudo transformations. Okay? So that's the thing we spent uh, a long time trying to come up with a proof scheme for this that people could read because you're in danger of uh, just drawing endless diagrams and we use this sort of multi-categorical approach, a skew multi-categorical approach. Um, we have a paper about this from the last year, uh, also for the lax versions and stuff. Um, but okay, so I want to talk about this and also a very, another variation. So let's call this the flexible skew structure. And let's look at its properties. So first of all, let's look at its categorical properties. So uh, it's very well behaved categorically. So just one random property, it's right normal. That means the right unit maps are invertible. Uh, oops, let me go back one. So the weak maps essentially by construction, the weak maps for the skewmanoidal category are the pseudomaps of Gala that I just mentioned. So a very important property, which, well, it doesn't appear in our paper, but which we've now proved, is it's what's called a symmetric skewmanoidal category. That's a kind of odd-looking concept. Uh, yeah. Uh, why? Wow. I was in plan, I don't really need to write this. Okay. So it involves things 
isomorphisms like that. Um, but so if you have a symmetric spumineral structure, it gives rise to a genuine symmetric closed uh, multi-category of sort of pseudo multi-maps. And, and using that context, we can see uh, how the old obstruction disappears. This becomes part of, so to give a amorphism from 2 to homet A, which by, since these pseudo maps are uh, normal, is just the same as a strict morphism, is by, by closeness in the multi category, then uh, the same things map like this. So we break the, uh, we overcome the obstruction. It's not really an obstruction, it's part of this by closeness at the level of weak maps, which isn't doesn't go at the level of strict maps, so it's a sort of subtle thing that we're trying to encode these weak maps. Uh, but that's a nice thing. So the bad news is that homotopically it's not well behaved. So the tensor product of cofinant objects in the uh, lack model structure on gray categories, so there's another natural model structure on gray categories, um, and this doesn't behave well with respect to that. Um, but there is, there's another variation that we can consider, which, so I call that one the flexible structure. Let's call this one the sharp structure. So the only difference is that now we, in our internal home, we restrict what the objects are. They're now the strict gray pointers. Um, but we see, so we can still get a skew-monoidal closed structure using this one. Uh, and we call that the sharp structure, okay? Uh, categorically, it's not quite as well behaved as the flexible one, so it's, it's left and right normal now. So, so both unit maps are isomorphisms, the associated is not. It's uh, not symmetric. But homotopically, it's extremely well behaved, so, so we haven't verified that it's got a full monoidal model structure. The reason for that is just that in this context where you have one-sided closeness, it's quite hard to check the, that you have a monoidal model structure because you can't use a generator sort of argument. Uh, but so instead, I mean it might have one, but so, so a satisfactory set of axioms to consider or ask that the Tensor product can preserves cofibrant objects and weak equivalence between them, the units cofibrant. That means you can derive it to the uh, left, derive it to the category, to the whole topic category. And then if you have a quill and a junction for each cofibrant there, uh, you can derive to a skewmanoidal blue structure on the homotopy category. Okay? So you can take this skew structure and derive it to the homotopy category. And the fun thing is that when you do this in this case, <coughs> the resulting structure you get is really symmetric and oil close. So it's sort of a skew structure, which is, is a, like a homotopy monoidal category. So for example, uh, this means that if you have cofibrant objects A, B, and C, the associator would be a weak equivalence, and things like this. Uh, and so an interesting remark is that you could not make this any stricter and keep the good homotopical behavior. So you couldn't uh, make that internal home any stricter. Uh, you would break the fact that you have a quill and junction. Uh, anyway, that's just, so this is a strict from, if you're interested in this uh, natural model structure, it's as strict as you could get. So anyway, so what about semi-strict four categories? So uh, you could look at one inch enriched in this sharp tensor product and so they're going to have palm gray categories and whiskering strictly by one cells on either side. Uh, the main new thing appears, or well, it's not so new, it's also in a gray category more or less. So at a composable pair of two cells, you get an adjoint equivalence now in the square. Um, then, whereas in a, in a gray category, at a situation like this, you would have a strict equality like this, uh, like on the, on the right, um, which would capture this pseudo-naturality. Here we have a invertible fourth cell. Uh, so, 
So the interesting thing about this approach is that we've been trying to build up the natural skew structures from the start and see what they are, and then just ask, what is a category enriched in this? Because it's not the thing you would come up with if you just sort of wrote down the axioms by hand. So in particular, we see that on the other side, the dual condition, you actually have a strict equality, which is quite weird. Um, but that you can think of that as sort of saying substitution of variables, pre-composition is stricter than post-composition also. Often it's kind of a weird phenomenon, but this seems to model it. And then finally there's two more constructors which would take a three cell and a two cell, or a two cell and a three cell. And uh, yeah, and so that's the data and there's some equations. We haven't explored them uh, too much, but so this seems like a reasonable thing to do. I uh, realize I'm running out of time. So an example would be gray cap with uh, this, in, this sharp internal home. I would mention also that, oops, Adrian Miranda in his thesis studied a subclass of these sorts of structures. Uh, so uh, that's interesting. And then, what else do I want to say? So finally remarks, you might be a bit confused about all the uh, there's a flexible thing, it has some good properties, there's the sharp thing, it has some other good properties. Um, okay, I wanted to say some things will force you to go into the flexible world. So if you have, because this, if you have a category enriched in sharp, uh, a semi strict one, then because of the lack of duality of the conditions, its opposite would only be flexibly enriched. So you sort of need to consider both of them a bit. But I tend to think of them as really uh, part of one structure. So, so there's a skew minoidal categories can be viewed as things called skew multi categories, and then uh, every skew multi category has has a sharp part, which is a universal. Or it has sharp multi maps, which are the universal way of looking at that, just as a multi category actually. So, so this is all sort of part of one structure, and I. When we, when we work uh, with these things, we tend to look at them from the multi-categorical uh, perspective. Um, yeah, and so that's about where we got to so far, so thanks for listening. Multi, multi category. Multi, yeah, yeah, that's right. Do you mean that you have any product and uh, your, uh, instead of your alpha, you have a span from triple? It's, uh, so, so the multi maps, the interesting thing about this humanoid structure is you, you have two kinds of multi maps. So you can think of a uh, binary multi map as something like that. It amounts to this. But then, uh, but then you also have sort of a weaker kind of multi map because you have this unit, so that, that sort of encodes that you have two kinds of uh, multi map, and also so for higher dimensions you have two three other kinds of. Yeah, I think we are talking a different level. Okay. I, instead of binary tensor, I have binary tensor, and from triple tensor I have morphism to A B C and to A C B. No, not CB. ABC, ABC both, but parentheses in different places. Uh, so <coughs> alpha, instead of alpha being non-isomorphism, to have a span. Yeah, so you can, you, can, you can look at uh, skew minority categories. When you look at skew multi categories and you draw the correspondence between them, that's part of the way of viewing them as equivalent to some other lax monoidal or variation of the structure of that form. So that is indeed, there is a, such a span. But, but it's not, I mean, a skew multi-category may not have a product at all. But... No, not a skew multi-category, but if I was thinking of the ones associated to skew monoidal. Okay, later, later I will ask okay. you. Thank you. One more short question up there, yes. So, you said you have the unique use of the monads and the monoid structure. Did you think you uh, so, I mean, 
Sorry, did we look at the algebras for the monad? Yeah. Uh, so, no, in this case, I think mean, well, that's a reasonable thing to do. We, look, we, know what the algebra, um, we know what the algebras for the co-monads uh, would be. Those would be, uh, those would be gray categories whose underlying uh, category is free on a reflexive graph. Um, so it's a sort of weak cofibrancy, algebraic cofibrancy condition, but uh, yeah. But of course, in other skewmonoidal settings, it is very interesting to look at the algebras and uh, coalgebras, and indeed in the original one, so the Slachani situation associated to any bialgebra, you have a skew structure, and then the category of coalgebras captures the uh, co modules for the bialgebra, and the category of algebras captures the, uh, the modules. So that's, it provides a nice sort of dual approach to your, it encodes all that structure in a nice way. Okay, thank you, John. I'm afraid for the question. Thank you very much. Thank you. Before you storm, storm off, the organizers tell me to remind.